Matt Liner gathering his thoughts. It's all on his shoulders now. There's 20 things in this game that don't ever happen, and they all happen. Absolutely incredible. They've scored no points on their own offense. Bears fans still shiver at this game, which somehow they won. There isn't anything more than Matt Liner can do. The Bears are who we thought they were, and we let them off the hook. Hey, everybody. Welcome to episode three of Run It Back, or as Chris Berman is calling it, Run It Back, 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 Gone. Peter and I sit around like Beavis and Butthead uh, watching Guar videos and just freak out about an old game from yesteryear that we miss and we want to get into. Peter, what is the video for today? Well, it's great that you mentioned Chris Berman because this will have a big ESPN feel to it. Week 6th, October 16th, 2006, Monday Night Football Under the Lights. The Bears visiting the Cardinals. Bears, one of the best teams in football. Cardinals, one of the worst. And yet, one of the most historic Monday Night Football games we've seen in the last 20 years. Kyle, where were you when you watched this game? Where was I for the Bears are who we thought they were game? Peter, it starts in the Studio City Bally's Gym on Ventura Boulevard. I was an actor living in Los Angeles at the time, a Chicago native. Uh, I used to work out at that gym alongside uh, Chris Evans, uh, Carl Lewis used to work out at that gym. And I'm sitting there at about, you know, one o'clock and I'm trying to get my cardio in and I'm watching Pardon the Interruption and it's on the TV in the gym and they're blowing out the format and talking about this Bears team. And Tony, of course, is part of the Monday Night Football broadcast. He's there on location in Arizona. It's Will Bond. And they're saying, this team's the 85 Bears. This is the best Bears team we've seen in 30 years. And I decided right there, I got off the treadmill. I said, I'm going to this game. I'm going to this game by myself. No one wanted to go with me. I bought a quick plane ticket out of Burbank, flew into Arizona, cabbed it to Glendale, bought a ticket in the parking lot, and the next thing you know, I was there in the stadium. Peter, I think this is the last game I've really attended as a real fan. I was there 10 rows back, Rex, Liner, Hester, everybody right there in the brand new sparkling stadium for those Cardinals. It was the first year of that stadium. That is some solo mission you went on. Tell me about that Bears team, because let's put us in that place. Yeah. It's week six. Why would you be so encouraged about the Bears, who really hadn't been to the playoffs the past few seasons, hadn't done much? Why that game? Why would you want to go to that game? Buzz. They were 5-0. and oh. The NFL is so fun when a big city's team is going. And, Tony, that Bears buzz is back again. Rex Grossman was our first-round draft pick. Notice I'm saying our. Our first-round pick out of Florida, and he'd been hurt. A couple years in a row, Rex would always get hurt, and we were dealing with Kyle Orton and Greasy and all these guys, and we had this young, great defense under Lovey, but Rex kept getting hurt. Rex was healthy now. So here is Rexy, as Steve Spurrier used to call him. The Bears were leading the NFL in scoring, and we're going to get into a lot of Rex. He was on fire. The offensive player of the month in the NFL in September was Rex Grossman, and this was the team that's going to beat everybody, go 16-0. National coming out party on Monday night. That's why I was there from the valley to the valley of the sun. Yeah, and the Cardinals that year had a whole other story. Look, this is a team that had been one of the worst franchises in football. They were 1-4, and four, and it was the third time in a row under Dennis Green. They started 1-4. and four. They have not won a Monday night football game going into this game since 1989, and yet they have their quarterback of the future. His name was Matt Liner. Matt Liner, all you need to do is look at two simple numbers in Matt Liner's life, 37-2 and two as a starter. That's what this young man has accomplished. Liner versus Rex Grossman. Who would have thought this was the best game that we would have that week? It might have been the best game we had that entire season. You add in all the Monday night football stuff from a weird era that included three broadcasters on a trio that I am shocked even existed and yet so thrilled they did. We're going to get into it, Kyle. Let's do it. Three broadcasters plus a Hall of Fame basketball player. Peter, we're both in hats, no makeup, no haircut in weeks. Should we run it back? Let's run it back. Let's run it back. Is it time to talk about Matt Leinert? I think it's already time to talk about Matt Leinert. Leinert's making his second career start in this game, and people forget now, but Matt Leinert in college, maybe one of the greatest college football quarterbacks of all time, a two-time national champion at USC, 
2004 Heisman Trophy winner, and he was the 10th overall selection in the 2006 NFL Draft. Everybody's raving about this guy, and Leinert comes out blazing. An incredible start to this game for Matt Leinert of the Arizona Cardinals, a rookie. He starts coming out there, and right away, it's a touchdown drive where it's Edron James, Edron James, Edron James, and then a beautiful touchdown to Bryant Johnson. Quick toss, Bryant Johnson made a man miss. Bryant Johnson to the end zone. Bears hadn't given up a touchdown all year in the first quarter or the first half, and this kid took him right down the field. What's crazy is that we're saying Brian Johnson's name and Edgerin's name, and we're going to say Anquan a lot. There's no Larry Fitz. Larry Fitzgerald is out of this game with a hamstring injury, and yet it doesn't matter. Remember, this Bears D is killing everybody. I'm standing on my seat in the stadium when they take the field, screaming, here comes the pain! Because I think they're going to destroy this rookie, and Erlach is going to break him over his knee. Leonard doesn't give a damn. He starts zipping them, and they go up fast. They have now Anquan Bolden. Touchdown, Arizona. First and 10, Grossman on play action. Trying to throw a lot. Intercepted! What is going on tonight? There's no way that that receiver is going to be anywhere near open. They're up 14-0. They had a field goal. They're up 17-0 on the Bears. We're talking about a major upset here and a major disappointment for Chicago because Kyle, the quarterback for the Bears, it didn't start off well. It didn't finish well for him in this game. One of the worst performances we've ever seen from a quarterback in a football game. This, it was an uncanny performance by Rex Grossman for all the wrong reasons. And he ends up throwing four interceptions. He has two lost fumbles at six turnovers and they win the game. And he said afterwards, all the right quotes, he said, I, I can't believe how bad I played. I've never played in a game that I played so badly and we still won. What's jarring about it is we're all looking back. Oh yeah, Rex didn't have it. You have to understand, this season, Rex was getting MVP chatter. I'm not kidding. He was going to end up throwing, I think he was on pace for 39 touchdowns or something, Offensive Player of the Month in September. And as Bears fans, it was a rattling night because they go into the bye after this. So they got two weeks to talk about this game. And you knew with Peanut and Erlacher and Mike Brown and everything, the defense was crazy, but it's like, this Rex guy might be some kind of head case. I don't know what the deal is, and for the next three years, even through a Super Bowl run, it was Lovey Smith, Rex is our quarterback, Rex is our quarterback. Bears fans still, I think, shiver at this game, which somehow they won. Quickly, let me set the stage. This is how 2006 it was. During the broadcast of Bears Cardinals Monday Night Football, the ESPN is running their crawl. Some of the nuggets you see on the crawl throughout the game. The Troy Vincent signs with the Redskins. Okay, that'll take you back. The Chicago Cubs signed Lou Pinella to be their manager. If you think that's the most 2006 thing you could ever hear, you might say, were Ashton and Demi at the game? Oh, you better believe Ashton and Demi were at the game. We know Ashton's a big Bears fan. He wears an Erlacher jersey in the movie Just Married. Um, so we know he's way into that, but it's big to go to that. And I'm putting this, this is post-punked Ashton. Might be around the time Demi was doing Charlie's Angels full throttle. And it get, gets a very, very cursory notice on the broadcast. I, I don't think Tariko et al. were very interested, but we are. Oh, Austin Demi Kutcher. Moore and right. Austin Kutcher. Christian Kutcher and Debbie. Demi might be uh, Demi. texting, excuse me. Demi might be texting you here in the first quarter. Second and seven for Grossman. It was 06. Stars were out, Peter. They were. And was there a bigger star in football that was ascending than Leinart at this point in time? It's very simple. Uh, I'll even go back a year before in 05. Uh, you know, I'm a soap opera star at the time. Peter, I snuck into the Playboy Mansion a few times. You would see, oh, you know, your, your typical uh, Bill Maher, Paulie Shore. Kilborn, uh, Paulie Shore for sure, Adrian Grenier. And then it's like, oh, dude. Leinert is here. Matt Leinert is here. Is that Lendale? The guys of the USC teams of that last Pat Pete Carroll run, they were the megastars. They were like Leo and Toby were doing their thing, but then like Matt and Reggie were doing their thing. It was incredible. All right, let's get to one of our favorite chapters and run it back. Let's talk about some jarring aesthetics. Just things that we look back on, we're like, whoa! <laughs> I can't believe that was a thing. Sometimes it's the uniforms, but I'll just start with X's and O's here, Peter. Um, you think... Devin Hester is the greatest return man of all time. They drafted him specifically to be a returner out of Miami. And yet the game starts and Rashid Davis is the kick returner for the Bears. And it's it actually put Hester in at the end to return kicks because they need a jump. But I'm not sure what Lovey was thinking in with, with they got 23 on the team and they're like, 
I don't know. Rashid Davis is, secures the ball and gives us the field position. It's it's asinine though. Yeah, Rashid Davis is returning kicks instead of Devin Hester. And then there's a an aesthetic with the look on some of the backs of these jerseys. Look, I grew up in New Jersey where Dave Brown from the Giants at one point had the words Dave Brown on the back of his jersey. Full name. No explanation why, but he was the quarterback and he had it for the Giants. And they went to the Cardinals and still stuck with like Dave Brown, full name. Not only is there one full name on the back of jerseys in this game, there's multiple ones. There's Todd Johnson with a full name for the Bears. And then there's the guy who caught the first touchdown pass, Bryant Johnson. And then there's Tank Johnson. They all have full names. It reminds me of my t-shirt drawer in eighth grade. A lot of Johnson on the t-shirt. I had a lot of them. <laughs> Big Johnson, uh, shotguns, construction, basketball. My mom was not a fan, but there's so much of that on the field in this. And it's, I don't know why they just couldn't go T Johnson, but if you watch them, it does look absurd, and yet it does kind of make me want to get a Bryant Johnson jersey of the yeah, Cardinals. And, and you went with the big Johnson. I was a co-ed naked guy, and I think that was Matt Leinert. <laughs> that was Matt Leinert's career uh, at USC. Co-ed naked yeah. everything. Go on. I was football is life. The rest <laughs> is just no details. Yeah, uh, but the guy who really thought football is life, apparently, was the guy wearing a face mask from, what like, 1915. What, what, All right, what, what, I guess we'll talk about Scott Player's face mask because he wants us to. It's the only reasonable reason you would ever do that. This is not, to be clear, Joe Theismann's in the booth. He yeah. had the one bar. A lot yeah, of people yeah. had one bar. Player's face mask is like a bar slash chin strap that goes below his chin, and Cornetter does a great job explaining on the call. You can't wear single bars anymore if you're coming into the league, but if you wore one, you're grandfathered in. And as old as Scott is, he qualifies to be a grandfather. But it's sagging, that bar. It's not even <laughs> upright. Can you imagine a punter or kicker, any player in 2020 wearing this ridiculous headwear. No, and you're right. It, it, you go into the time capsule. LaDainian Tomlinson had already been wearing the visor. Like, it wasn't like this is, oh, no. Scott Player goes out of his way to say, I'm going with the, like, a fantastic decision stylistically. And he actually plays pretty well in this game. He does. He does. It, it, I have to be honest, though, Peter. You and I, we love this stuff. We love barefooted kickers and everything. He looks like an imbecile. <laughs> put, put on a helmet. Come on. He looks like a guy in a unicycle. He's, a punter. He's just doing it for attention. You can't be kidding me. Um, other quick ones. There's a majestic Kyle Orton siding or five. In this game, he appears to have like the Rachel, you know, the the, the flat iron hair that's hanging yeah. down. <laughs> what is Hard that? Hair. And then the last jarring aesthetic. We've got this Monday night football game, and we're trying to pump it up, but like Kurt Warner's on the sideline. Backing up Matt Leinart, holding a clipboard, looks like a wonderful veteran quarterback that has no real chance of getting into this game and making no real impact. Knowing what became of Kurt in Arizona, it's a jarring visual to see him in Leinart's ear. They were all in my face. face. Yeah, I didn't have a chance to okay. follow through. Somebody up the gut and then oh, yeah. somebody up Everything, the they, they don't, don't. I've never seen this before. Me neither. <laughs> It's like if you went to like some sort of music festival and like Sting was singing backup to like the guy from 21 Pilots or something like can we get Sting to come up? We'd like to hear him a little bit. I remember Kurt came on Good Morning Football with us once and we asked him a question when he was going to the Hall of Fame. Was there ever a time you felt like hanging it up, all the highs and lows you went through? And he said, I got to be honest, there was a time I was in Arizona and I was backing up Matt Leinart and I was running scout team in practice and I was thinking, I don't know. I mean, this might be it. I think he's talking about right now in this period, and it's unbelievable. He, they don't, they had no thought of going to him, and then eventually, a couple of years later, they go to him and they go to the Super Bowl. Kurt Warner, at this point in his career, had just been benched in successive seasons by a Mark Bulger era in St. Louis, an Eli Manning era in New York, and then he's with the Cardinals, and they draft Matt Leinart with a tenth overall pick. The postscript on it is incredible, and I think it's what makes Kurt Warner such a special guy and such a special player. And then there's the broadcast itself, because it's not just Mike Tirico and Joe Theismann. Tony Kornheiser is such an X factor in here, and we can get into Kornheiser's performance in this game and in Monday Night Football in general, but he is truly cracking wise throughout this thing. And as if we didn't have enough voices with a three-man booth on Monday Night Football... They decide to drop Charles Barkley in for not just a play, not just a series, but the entire second 
quarter. These fans aren't stupid. They know the Cardinals are, are scared to death right now. I'm going to make a prediction. Yeah. Go ahead. 20 ain't going to be enough to win this game. If well, it isn't, we'll bring you back here <laughs> late in the game. And everybody always said you were up for the Monday night booth anyway. You can right. come and sit with us forever. Don't leave on my job. Hey, I'm just glad to be around Joe. I used to watch Joe when I was a little kid. <laughs> I've been a big fan for a long time. Hey, we will uh, see you on TNT during basketball season. Hey. See you on the road. Thank you all for see having me. And how about that? Barkley is just a, a sign of the future when he'd be sitting there busting chops with Kenny and Ernie and Shaq says 20 points ain't gonna be enough to win this game and he was right he was dead on but Peter I can't get over the fact that he was there for an entire quarter it's a long time can you imagine for example if I don't know Marshall Mathers was there for a whole quarter with Herp Street and Musburger's <laughs> I mean, it's a lot, and this was not a one-off. They did this all season long with whoever wanted to come up. No, and and, and it's it was it's a fascinating moment in time with everyone trying to be cute with the booth these days and figure out the right mix. They had a gimmick, and it was a gimmick that I think worked at times and was way off at others. If you go back and watch the 2006 Monday Night Football season, let me give you some of these. There was a Vikings Redskins game where Jamie Foxx does a quarter. There was a Chargers Raiders game where Arnold Schwarzenegger did a full quarter. <laughs> Ravens Broncos, they do the little cross promotion with ABC, a Disney tie in. James Denton from, Always. from Desperate Housewives is Denton there. Denton was everywhere, Peter. He was like Ty Burrell before Ty Burrell. Like, you could always count on Denton to show up. And then, like, you know, Panthers Eagles, it's Sylvester Stallone. And the one I remember the most because he comes right in and is just busting balls throughout was a Packers-Seahawks game, like a big game between the Packers and Seahawks, and Jimmy Kimmel is is literally doing just comic relief throughout the quarter, and Kornheiser's cackling throughout it. The reason I liked Kornheiser, because he's not afraid to open up a can. Listen, the story of this game was, I'll put it bluntly, the Cardinals have sucked for a long time. They sucked this year, apparently, and now they got this opportunity. Oh, my gosh, this is a signature win that's going to save jobs and put them on the map, and they're going to win it at home. And at one point, when they're way up, Kornheiser says, if they can't finish this one now, with all the turnovers they've created, with what they've done to Rex Grossman, if they can't finish this one now, then we can't even listen to them for the rest of the year. All the, the, the air. franchise, yeah, just close up the dome. Put the roof on it and give it back to, is it Pendergast? Yep. Give it back to his family and resell it as a, a pizza haven. This it's over for football if they don't hold on to this one. I like that kind of commentary because it's right because they should have won the game and they are cruising 20 to nothing at the half. They're pitching a shutout. Missed from 52, good from 41, this from 28. And the Arizona Cardinals... Go to the locker room leading 20 to nothing. Shocking first half. 20 to nothing at the half, and yet we get the Barkley foretelling of this might not go perfectly, and there's still a hint of skepticism from the announcers as we start the third quarter. It's obviously early. The Bears are a great scoring team, but if Arizona were to win this game, there are two things would happen. One, Matt Leinart has a career maker, and it may help save Denny Green's job, who doesn't need a third straight losing season. Third quarter starts, and the Cardinals continue to dominate the Chicago Bears in this game. The lead gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and at one point, after stopping Rex Grossman in the Bears' offense on a three and out late in the third quarter, Joe Theismann comes out and says, we're going to have to give out a case of game balls for the Cardinals in this game. A case of game balls. It's going that well. This is one of those nights where what you do is you just get cases of game balls. So I'm there as a fan. And two things, I'm the biggest idiot because I just blew a whole bunch of dumb cash on stupid plane tickets and game tickets. And it's the worst Bears game in history. And then you would understand this, Peter. I'm there and I'm texting with my friends on my BlackBerry Curve. And they're all in Chicago. And they're all like, what the hell, man? Like, this is on you. Like, you know how your stupid yeah. friends are like, you're there. Like, you got to get us home. Like, it was my fault. It, I was there. I was, I was in person. And I think generally for Bears fans, it was like, oh, well, I, there goes the Super Bowl. We don't have it. Rex isn't good. We're not going to win this game. That was fun for five weeks. So all hope is lost. The season's been blown. Rex can't play. There goes the undefeated record. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, on the last play of the third quarter, I'm going to turn the head around like Lincoln Hawk, a lightning strike in the desert. Second half for the 15, huh? he's hit from behind. Mark Anderson, the hit, the scoop and score for Mike Brown. The Bears get 
right back in it. The Bears are on the board, and Peter, we need to pause down for a second, and we need to raise a glass to Mike Brown. Yes, Such a short career, so many injuries. In fact, that play where he scoops and scores was his last play of the game, his last play of the season. That was it. He missed the Super Bowl run. He became a hero for the Bears during the 2001 season. People remember this. In back-to-back -back weeks, he had walk-off touchdowns off Jeff Garcia and the Niners. And then the very next week, Tim Couch and the Browns. He was one of these guys, Peter, that was about 208 pounds, a relentless hitter. He had a lot of Bob Sanders to him, a lot. And sort of to his own detriment, he would hit so hard that often he would kind of detonate himself. But he certainly was there to pick up the ball, change this game. He let, missed the rest of the season, missed the season after it. But Brown still brought it. I miss Mike Brown, and they don't win this game without him. You know, it's funny. There's a little window or a little chapter in NFL history of guys that just made big plays. I know. And I think Larry Brown from the Cowboys, you know, those big play games. Tracy Porter, when yes. he was with the Saints, just uh, made big plays. Keith Bullock. Keith Bullock was Always. like Mr. Monday Night. In big games. And, like, that's what Mike Brown was. And I think Bears fans really, really have a place in their heart for him. And yet, they're only down 13 points in this game now. But you still don't feel like the Bears have a shot because history is not on their side. There is a graphic yeah. that ESPN puts up that is just mind-blowing. Chicago has lost its last 16 games in which it trailed going into the fourth quarter. That's the longest consecutive current streak in the NFL. You're in the building. You're excited that they scored, but you're down 13 going in the fourth. There's no recent history of a comeback here. No, and we just can't overstate. We can't do it. Physically impossible, Peter. How bad Rex Grossman is right now in this game. Coming into this game, Rex Grossman was the celebrated quarterback. Rex Grossman has not been able to generate any offense. Your score came on a defensive play, and Weiner has been the guy to take center stage and make it work for him. I remember... As a Bears fan, not only on this night, but kind of for the rest of the season, we used to joke, honestly, with as much as the defense scores and with this young punt returner we got, can we just punt on first down? Like, just punt the ball on first down to get out of Rex's hand. We'll score more with our defense and special teams. Kind of what ended up happening the rest of the way. Before we even get the chance to even talk comeback, Darnell Dockett makes an absolutely <laughs> incredible play. Let's see the Darnell Dockett play that should have put this game on ice. So they eschew the opportunity for the 45-yard field goal to make it a 10-point game and try to pick it up on fourth down. Coming off the corner, Antrell Roll is picked up. Grossman's pass is knocked down, and it is intercepted. Darnell Dockett comes away with the pick. As he continues down the field, no one has marked him down, and with a convoy of Cardinals, Dockett takes it all the way to the end zone. Chicago is challenging the ruling on the field that the runner was down by contact. And he's right. <laughs> it is a pick for a defensive lineman. They always like to have those. So he was obviously down. It's something very 06 Cardinals about doing backflips in the end zone and talking to the camera on the sideline when you knew you were down. And Peter, we're burying the lead here. Do you remember what Darnell Dockett became famous for on the World Wide Web? It's one of the first internet... Superstar. It's a pioneer. I mean, you can, in the era of around that Tila Tequila golden era, Darnell Dockett just straight up took a shower on Ustream. And he's like, yeah, this is me. Everybody want to drop by? And now it'd be like, oh, that's Logan Paul. But now, back then, it was the defensive tackle doing it. That was him. And, and then back to the football game, they get, the, they get that play overturned. So you're like, all right, the Bears have another shot. And then Grossman, inexplicably, with a few minutes left to go in the game, they get the ball back. He throws another pick, his fourth interception. He was booed in the preseason when they played the Cardinals. Everybody in Chicago was uptight about Rex. His teammates were. Throw. Great read. Picked off by Robert Griffith, the 13-year veteran. He just absolutely refused to take underneath receivers. He kept trying to bite off big chunks. And he either overthrew him, and if he was home in Chicago right now, they would be booing louder than they did in the preseason. You know what the best thing is for Rex Grossman? Is there was no Twitter in 2006. I mean, remember remember Nathan Peterman when that whole thing went yeah. down? Grossman would have been annihilated. And I think at this moment at Bears fans, that's when you're like, well, we're going to go 5-1. and one. How's the draft looking next year? Yeah. Who's coming out in college? Who's the next Matt Liner? we got to get this Liner kid because apparently uh, he's the next Namath. Yeah, and you're thinking, okay, game is over now. It's 23 to 10. No, now Carmel, it's over. It now it's over. Be. 
You know, the quarterback cannot complete a pass without throwing it to the other team. Now it's over. And yet, Cardinals, second play from scrimmage. Next time they get the ball, a certain number 54 shows up, and he shows up big. Second down, here's James. Right into the line. Did the ball come out? It did. It is scooped up by the Bears. Charles Tillman takes it the distance, and Chicago is very much alive. Watch Erlacher here, guys. Kept reaching in and just pulled it out of the arms of James. Six-point game, five minutes left. Wow. How about 54? <laughs> I, I, this is the best game of Brian Urlacher's career. I think in a lot of ways, that was the most iconic play of his career. And he's had he had some big picks off Aaron Rodgers in big games. Urlacher! Rodgers in a foot race, Urlacher tripped up. Early in his career, he had a pick six off Michael Vick in the Dome in Atlanta. He had this a pick six in the playoffs, play, I think, I once. Yep. Yeah, I, I think this is hero ball. I mean, this is like, I'm not going to let my team lose. Devin Hester said after the game, they're asking him about his punt return. He said, they said, how about Urlacher? And he said, he turned into the Incredible Hulk. I've never seen anything like him. Brian Urlacher has decided to take over this football game. I mean, he's, he has really been all over. Kyle, he had 19 tackles in this game, a career high. He's all over the field. I have been lucky enough to become very friendly with Brian Urlacher, where he worked on Fox Sports uh, pregame show years ago. We kept in touch, so I texted him. Texted him. I texted Brian Urlacher. Yeah. Here's the exchange. Oh, what do you got? I texted him, Kyle. I said, hey, what do you remember from the 06 Cardinals Monday night game? Brian writes back this. This is Brian Urlacher, first ballot Hall of Famer. What's up, buddy? I remember us whooping their ass. <laughs> we struggled that entire game, and then the last 10 minutes, we got our bleep together, and we took care of business. I said, such a monumental game. You could argue it was your best game ever. He writes... You know what I remember from that one? I saw Ashton Kutcher in the tunnel afterwards. <laughs> yeah! Now that's why he's a Hall of Famer. <laughs> he saw Ashton, and Ashton, I'm sure, was fired up. Wow. But Kyle, 19 tackles, that play there, and everyone talks about Ray Lewis as the defining middle linebacker of that generation. And maybe there were other guys in the conversation. For Bears fans, there's only been one guy, and you could talk about it, number 54. I've heard things when he was playing and since then that people want to say Erlacher's overrated. Watch the fourth quarter of this game and you tell me that he's overrated. You're out of your mind. He is a complete maniac, best player on the field, first ballot Hall of Famer. And I think he made first ballot, Peter, because of this game. It did occur to me, could this have been some sort of meta, largely expanded episode of punked where the arizona cardinals get punked i mean i remember the zach braff episode and the one with uh you know ac slater and trichelle from the real world i think the best episode of punked was monday night football and the cardinals they really fell for it yeah omarion from b2k <laughs> uh really got it bad there on punked but you say that erlacher was the best player on the field and, yeah. and that's very fine in a blanket statement I would like to make a counter argument on this one. Um, did you see Devin Hester in this game? Oh my God. Cardinals have to punt the ball with 317 left because that Bears defense stands them up again. It's now a one score game and the Cardinals for some inexplicable reason decide to punt to number 23. Devin Hester back to return the punt. You saw what he did in his first game from the 18. Reading box, Devin Hester into the open field. And Hester picks up another block. Devin Hester, the punter to beat. He beat him. Devin Hester, all the way. Touchdown, Chicago Bears. It's just incredible. 82 yards. Absolutely incredible. They've scored no points on their own offense. And now the Bears are suddenly winning. And they're in the lead. And... Their offense has not done squat, and yet between Erlacher and Mike Brown and now Hester. An unbelievable comeback by the Bears here in Arizona. 24-23. Kyle, we have heard your story throughout this game. What was your reaction when that happened? Tears. I, I teared up. And Peter, really? I'm not even exaggerating. I have goosebumps right now. Devin Hester is my favorite all-time Chicago Bear. I grew up a Walter Payton fan, but I just I was obsessed with Hester. Pure, pure adrenaline of like a six-year-old in the, in the stadium. There was actually a shot of me. I was wearing that Neon Bears logo, like a pendant around, like Flava Flav. That was me. Um, you got to understand about Hester at this point. 
He was not a sensation. There was no talk of kicking away from Hester. Most people, Hester wasn't on the radar. In week one, he had a punt return touchdown against the Packers. Now this is five weeks later, and there was none of this Devin Hester taking over the NFL, kick it out of bounds. You just kick it to him, and I always love the nuance. Hester says, I have a special move. It's almost like a pro wrestler. When I catch it, I like to stop for a second because that makes the coverage stop and slow down, and then I go, and he gets them on this one, man. Of course, you fast forward to the Super Bowl later that season. Everyone tells Tony Dungy, don't kick the ball off to, to Devin Hester. Whatever you do, okay. And at the moment before the game, Dungy decides, let's kick it off to, to, to Devin Hester. And sure enough, it's one of the most famous kick returns in Super Bowl history. But this was before all that. Before, you're right, this was before Devin Hester was a Hall of Fame candidate and a guy that you absolutely avoided at all costs. Yeah, this season is the greatest special team season ever played. He had two returns in one game against the Rams. He's running the kick out of the back of the end zone and the missed field goal. He was the coolest story of the 2006 season was Devin Hester. And this was really the official beginning. But I think it's interesting because people, this is why we do this, Peter. You look back in this game and you're like, and Hester returned the punts and then the Bears won and it was over. And Not then even close. close. No. no. It's, there's a lot of action to go, and unfortunately for Arizona, a lot of heartbreak. But the story set up here, and Theismann was all over it, this is Matt Leinart's time. This, this is, is the guy, fight on, fight on. And Matt Leinart gathering his thoughts. It's all on his shoulders now. It's all on you. This is what you do. It's what you do. Leinart throws underneath. Complete for the first down to Edgerin James. It's third down. Liner throws complete for the first down to Ayam Badejo. That liner looks like he's been here before. He ends up in Arizona where they have no history of winning, and he's got a chance to pull off the biggest upset of the year. And just his second career start on Monday Night Football moves them all the way downfield to set up a chippy field goal for Neil Rackers. This will be the game. Neil Rackers, who has been one of the best kickers in football for a decade, steps up to the plate, and this is what happens. He hasn't missed from inside 50 this year. Hester charges off the edge. The field goal is leaking. It's no good. He missed it to the left. The Rackers missed it. That doesn't happen. There's 20 things in this game that don't ever happen, and they all happen. You don't have six turnovers and not score an offensive touchdown and have still a 40-yard field goal for a really good veteran kicker. He makes that, and yet he missed. And you know what, Peter? After the game, Lovey Smith just straight up said it. He referred to them as a team of destiny. Head coaches don't say that about their own teams, but I think he was right. It felt like that. There, there's two little notes here that I want to get to because Rackers had made five or six field goals up to that point. He was a pro bowler the year before. This was not some, you know, fill-in kicker for the week. Rackers was one of those guys in the league, like one of the top kickers in the league. Secondly, remember, they hadn't won a Monday Night Football game since 1989, and right before Rackers goes up for the kick, Tarico sprinkles one in. You can tell he plays for the Cardinals because he and his wife, Rachel, Monday night is their date night. And it was basically <laughs> saying, like, right. here's this crap franchise for the last 20 years. And this is what's going to happen. And Rackers misses the field goal. And you see him just devastated, runs up. And then, Kyle, you get another shot of somebody. The late, great Dennis Green. Denny Green walks off the field with what I would call a rage walk. He wants <laughs> nothing to do with the pleasantries, with the celebration. He is so angry. And you can understand why. Because as we know, like the greatest takeaway from this game is not... Matt, Devin Hester. It is not Rex Grubbs. It's none of that. It's Denny Green rage walking right off the field, right to the podium, and right into NFL history like this. The Bears are what we thought they were. What, what, they're what we thought they were. We played them in preseason. Who the hell takes a third game in a preseason like it's bull? bull we played them in the third game. Everybody played three quarters. The Bears are who we thought they were. And that's why we took the damn field. If you want to crown them, then crown their ass. But they are who we thought they were. And we let them off the hook. And we let them off the hook. And it's one of my favorite post-game podium nice. appearances of all time. And there is some more info that we have on this now. Because the late, great Dennis Green, in the production meeting, what they always do with the broadcast yep. team, took umbrage with the fact that the announcers were crowning the Bears going into this game. And I would assume the local media, that anger, that fury, 
as as misplaced as it might have seemed afterwards at the time, now there's at least a little bit more information that we have. Denny Green didn't like the fact that everyone was saying the Bears are going to blow out the Cardinals. Well, they did. In that moment, Denny Green became an immediate, no five-year waiting period, streamlined <laughs> first ballot Hall of Famer into the, what I would call the 2000s sports radio soundbite Hall of Fame. Welcome, <laughs> Denny Green. You're in. You are welcomed by your brothers, uh, Herm Edwards. You play to win the game. Hello? You play to win the game. Jim Mora with the playoffs. He's in. Playoffs? Don't talk about it. Playoffs? You kidding me? Playoffs? I just hope we can win a game. Uh, obviously, Allen Iverson yeah, practice. Yeah. Not a game. Not a game. Practice. He's in. Um, I'm also going to put uh, Mike Gundy. Uh, I'm a man. I'm yep. 40. Come after me. And Denny Green. The Bears are who we thought they were. And we let him off the hook. And the walkout. Just exit stage right. And you are out of here. First ballot Hall of Famer. Peter, is there anybody I'm missing? No, that you nailed him. As long as you got the Iverson one in there, that's a classic. Yeah, it's so funny. There's a postscript to this. If you watch the full press conference, a lot of times it cuts out there. Mark Dalton, who is the longtime PR guy for the Arizona Cardinals and a dear friend of mine and yours, he's got a moment in this thing that I would love for us to be able to show. Let's take a look at how Dalton responds after Dennis Green storms off. Thanks, Coach. Matt Leinert will be one of the person in this room probably about five minutes away. What are you gonna Dude, do? You know, Matt Leinert has to speak. So Dalton does that, and of course... The season progresses. The Bears ride that momentum. They go and have one of the most historic seasons the franchise has ever had. They go to the Super Bowl. Kyle, that season for the Chicago Bears, as a fan, I know you always have 85 as this like place in your heart, but the 06 Bears are pretty special too, huh? Yeah, I mean, I, I won the, the sports fan Powerball as a young person. I was there for all the Jordan championships, and I still think that I know people want to say it was the moment that Rizzo caught the ball at first base and the Cubs won it all. I think the most exciting, the highest high I've ever had as a sports fan in my life was the opening kickoff of the Super Bowl and Hester and the flashbulbs and he's gone. And you think, we're going to win the Super Bowl. There's no chance they don't win after that. And Rex was pretty bad and it was wet and they just didn't make enough plays and Reggie Wayne got loose and they couldn't win it. But it was a really, really, I think that game, really the Cardinals game, was the pinnacle of the season in a lot of ways. Fun season for the Bears. They obviously go to the Super Bowl, lose to Peyton Manning and the Colts in the rain in Miami. But this game was kind of like one of those deals where you look back and you say, wow, there were so many expectations for this guy, that guy, this guy, that guy. And I don't know. I, I'm kind of left feeling a little empty. I, and I'm going to start with Leinert, who, again, is a great college quarterback and was a good NFL quarterback in moments. Actually had a fairly decent career, but he never rebounded from this game in itself. And it wasn't even on him. But Leinert, his career kind of peters out. Kurt Warner takes over the starting job eventually, and it's Kurt Warner taking them with Ken Wisenhunt as the head coach right onto the Super Bowl and almost beating the Steelers just two years later. Leinart, not a huge fan of Wisenhunt, and has had a lot about it afterwards. So it, it was an ugly ending. Nobody wanted that for Matt Leinart. I don't care if you're a UCLA fan, Notre Dame. It wasn't how it was supposed to play out. No, it absolutely wasn't. And now he's had a great career uh, doing studio work for Fox and is one of the most beloved guys in sports media. So it all works out for Matt Leinart. Rex Grossman... He's a quarterback in a Super Bowl. Look, I, say what you want. There's only been 54 Super Bowls. There's only been so many quarterbacks who have started a Super Bowl. Rex Grossman has started a Super Bowl and actually took his team in the playoffs and won some big games. Yeah, it was like, I look back, I, I try to think of the positive of Rex because it was really close to me. And you had to love Rex because he was, he was a gunner, man. He was going to chuck that thing. I mean, he was like kind of dollar store Brett Favre maybe or something like that which is respectable <laughs> he was totally fearless would throw it into anything but a lot hangs on Rex and a lot that's not his the Super Bowl this game what happened afterwards I think he had the D bounced around I remember Rex on the Redskins yeah I think he might have been on the Texans yeah, yeah yeah and then the last time I saw him he was on Cameo I, I don't know what the price is but he was more than willing to say happy birthday <laughs> yeah so Peter before we wrap here episode three of Run It Back when you look back at Bears Cardinals 2006 what is your lasting image to this day I wish I could tell you it was the football I wish I could tell you I could have rattled off what happened in this game but my lasting image is Dennis Green, the late great Dennis Green a fantastic NFL head coach who had a lot of success in this league at the podium 
making an all-time classic soundbite that would be used in beer commercials for decades to come and really making us laugh, just having a good chuckle. Now, if you want to crown them, then crown their ass. Crown their ass. It's an all-timer, Kyle. It's legendary. That's mine. What's yours? I mean, I, I would love to say that it's it's Kornheiser in the booth with Barkley or it's, that stuff's fun. It was very 06, but it's Hester for me. It's Devin Hester. A star was born, the most electric special teams player ever in the sport. And there's this beautiful football careening through the desert night down in the hands of 23 and everything changes. And me as a fan, I was probably about 25 at the time, I guess. I mean, I'm not making this up. I was hugging strangers. I had tears in my eyes. We were chanting 6-0. and There's a lot of Bears fans there. And then we went out to spend the night. And as you know, Peter, Arizona's a fun town uh, if you know where to go. So Hester, 06 Bears. I always say this about the Chicago. Cubs can win. Bulls can win. Blackhawks win. We've seen it all. It's a Bears town. And it was never happier since the 85 Bears than it was when Devin Hester crossed the goal line. And 06 looked like they were for real. Kyle, that was great. That's it. Another episode of Run It Back. Ashton, Demi, you, me, and Brian Erlacher, Devin Hester, and a little Dennis Green. Kyle, that was a blast, dude. Always is. Run it back. See you in episode four.